as we enter the new year, many of us will set about to create change and set new goals. So how do we go about creating change? In my experience, it typically involves creating a practice of some type, um, exercising discipline, and having consistency. One example of a very powerful practice that can help us to transform our physical beings and our mental well-being is the ancient tradition of yoga. Our guest today on the Soul Pod is Coco Teodoro. Coco is a longtime practitioner of yoga. He, Coco is also a longtime teacher of yoga. And Coco has owned multiple yoga studios and has taught thousands and thousands of people over the course of his decades of teaching. Now, Coco believes that simply by showing up, you can transform yourself. That's all it takes. Uh, Coco is no bullshit. Coco does not sugarcoat anything. He's a very authentic person. I loved my conversation with Coco and I enjoyed hearing the insights he had to share about how yoga can transform you today. And I hope you'll enjoy it too. And we're live. All right. It feels always good to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is our first live podcast for the Soul Pod. So Coco, thank you for joining us. Very right, welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to introduce you. I just realized, I actually don't know how to pronounce your last name. Is it Teodoro or is Teodoro. it Teodoro? Teodoro. Teodoro. Okay. T-E-O-D-O-R-O. Lots of, lots of O's. So, okay. Yes. So we are, we're interviewing Coco Teodoro, uh, who I've met or who I heard about first through uh, a very close friend of mine, Casey Parker. That's her original name. Her married name is Bozy Dash. Uh, Park is easy to say. Yeah, Park is it. We'll go, I, we all call her Parker. So, or I call her Parker. So uh, she's somebody who I always, her and I kind of grew up in the same hood. Uh, we come from, I grew up in Lake Grove. She grew up in Lake Ronkonkoma. And it's sort of the similar style of suburban area uh, for those who don't know and outside of New York City. And we had very similar experiences. Her and I were, um, you know, we've been around a lot of different uh, interesting stuff. I'd say we grew up in a pretty, you know, eclectic space and we had a lot of uh dysfunction in our childhood we all her and i acknowledge it we kind of used our each other as sounding boards mm -hmm. to deal with it all and so it was funny because we found out later on after we lost touch a little bit in high school that we actually both gravitated to dharma and to buddhism and it made sense to me because we experienced some degree of suffering and we you always used to talk about it but we never had a framework to kind of make sense of it all. And so when I found Dharma um, and then reconnected with Casey and she had told me what she had found and she was into yoga and she also found Dharma and that through yoga as well, we just had, a, the resonance was different at that point. So she's been teaching yoga for, I don't know, two two decades now or over two decades. And she, she went to work for you and she first told me about your studio called Coca Motion, uh, which how many studios do you own in total? I, well, there was three studios, okay. but the pandemic has taken a toll, and it's now yeah. there's one studio. Okay, I was saying only one, and I, was, I, I realized that was a stupid way to say it. So it, I have one studio, the original studio. The original, where is that one? It's in Miller Place. Okay. Yeah. So it's Miller Place, Suffolk County, Long Island, for anybody that's listening. Um, Casey started working where? Did she work at the Miller Place one first? Or? Uh, Casey started working, I believe, in our Patchwork studio. Okay. Yeah, that's where I believe she started working there and she taught in the Miller Place studio and she presently teaches in the Miller Place studio. Okay. Yes. So um, I trust her word, you know, pretty, pretty strongly because <laughs> she was pretty discriminating about who she lets into her circle and who she Where's finds a whole value. And she's just a genuine human being. And um, so she talked about you a lot. She's like, you got to come down. You got to check this guy out. You got to check these studios out. They're, they're on a different level. You know, you and I, her, Casey and I used to make judgments about certain Long Island style. Uh, there's a different style to Long Island type of business and to social environment, I would say. Um, it's a suburb, so things can get easily commodified, I feel like. So a lot of yoga that I always knew growing up was always taught in gyms, right? Yeah. And yoga studios like I'd find in like Brooklyn, New York City or Manhattan, for example, you just wouldn't find out here. No. Um, and you wouldn't find teachers that were, they really cared about practicing yeah. with a spiritual element. It was mostly what I, at least, you know, I could be, no, I mean, my experience was that where you found yoga studios, it was taught in a gym and mm -hmm. rarely were they people who cared very much about the spiritual element of it. Yeah. Um, 
Casey then kind of wanted to bring that herself through her practice to Long Island. And then in your venue, she found that that was something that was a natural fit. Yeah. So let's just start from the beginning for you. We just talked about it before we came on. You grew up in Selden, Long Island. Yes. And what was your experience like growing up? My experience growing up, um, the, well, there's six of us um, and single household, you know, when I was probably like eight or so, that's when it became a single household. Um, and it was cool growing up in Selden. You know, I grew up at a, a really cool time of life. I'm 52. And growing up back then, we we rode BMX bikes and hung out in the woods and built forts and went skating a lot. And um, there was a really big, strong community. Everybody hung out. Everybody always met at the corner, played a lot of hockey in the streets. Um, you know, and the trouble you got into was the trouble I think you were supposed to get into when you were growing up, you know, like riding on stop signs and stuff. Um yeah, I really, I really enjoyed Selden. I, I call it Selden Strong. From, nice. Yeah, from that area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with Selden. Obviously, I grew up in Lake Rill, which is two towns. You have Center Reach in between Selden yeah. and you have Selden. Yeah, and they all have nicknames. <laughs> they do, yeah. I won't even tell you. I'm actually a little embarrassed about our nickname because we had to, uh, we were always right. Like Sachem is the, my high school that I grew up in. It's a huge high school. It's like the size of a uh, college pretty much. And we were always kind of, warring with other different neighborhoods so we had to make our neighborhood sound tough so we didn't have any lake rove like it sounds like a nice little leave of the beaver area so yeah. we just put a lyn on the end of it like brooklyn and we just called it lake Rovelin, which didn't really work but for us it made us feel like we had something to, to turf to like kind of hold on to it wasn't uh it didn't ter- it didn't intimidate anybody else unfortunately no. <laughs> especially not anybody in center reach yeah or in selden it, but you know it might have worked on fire island yeah, yeah. There's certain locations <laughs> for those who don't know. There's certain locations in Long Island that are not as they don't have the tough exterior that other ones do. And uh, yeah, that one Lake Grove never did. No. But but we grew up. I spent most of my time in Ronkonkoma, which is kind of known for having sort of a, a tough exterior and having some. You know, it's it's where people would would travel out from the city and and buy former bungalows that used to be around Lake Ronkonkoma, mm-hmm. convert them. It was sort of an easy low income entry into the area. And that came with a different type of a, a mix of people than than you have yeah. in other areas, and it just it just you know usually it would involve what that matriculation would look like. Yeah, right? and you and you guys have the Indian, the, you know that's a, that's an amazing amazing thing itself. No one has that on Long Island. Yeah, you know that's pretty crazy. Yeah, there's a there's a tale about the lake where uh, there's a princess. Who uh, apparently she? The story goes she had a, a relationship with. Did you hear, you know? You, I know the story. It's yeah, right. no, she, I love it. she had a relationship with a, a white settler, and it was forbidden. And so they allegedly walked out into the lake together and committed suicide. And then the theory is that she takes a life, a male life, every year or very off, every so often, uh, as a way of kind of I don't know if it's retribution or just kind of retaining her hold on on the area. Yeah. But um, people believe it, and there is some there is some substance to it. There's yeah, some facts. There's that definitely some substance. People, to it. you know, there are drownings in the lake, and yeah. there happen to be a lot of guys. Yep. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. I believe it. I believe in Santa Claus too. So <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. We're actually filming this two days before Christmas. Yes, so. we are, man. Excited to be here. Yeah, man. So, um, so you grew up in Selden. So, so let's. So then, what? Let's. I want to fast track a little bit. Yeah, go if you don't for mind. It. Yeah, no, yeah. How did you get into yoga? What is yoga to you? What is yoga to you? Oh man. When people say, hey, like if someone who doesn't know anything about yoga and they just want you to give their, give them the elevator pitch about what yoga is, what does it mean to you? I think yoga is, is constantly changing and it's, it's, it's always changing for what it is to you. But if I had to do an elevator pitch and I normally, my elevator pitch is to, is to kids that are, um, I go to a lot of high schools. I go to a lot of, um, even grade schools to teach yoga to, uh, during the day. It's a lot of fun. And I tell oh, wow. them, I tell them all one thing. I was like, you're going to have to choose something to take care of yourself. And once you choose this thing and then you practice it, it becomes yours. Mm. And I said, if it's running, you'll add something to running. Yeah. You know, cause running is not going to be complete. Um, you know, and I'd say, you talk about the new things like CrossFit, um, having a Peloton bike in your house, you'll have to add something to that. That's why they all add things to it. So when I come to these places, I explain to them that, like my elevator pitch is that I believe that the yoga is the best choice to make for life, to help you 
keep your body strong mentally and mentally strong as well. That's worked for me as a discipline. And pretty much to hit the right point, it's a discipline. That's what it comes down to. What if, um, so I'm just curious, these kids, do they actually, do they know what's going on? Do, they, do, they, do you feel like you're actually like getting through to them in a way that they, they understand exactly what it is? Or? You, you know, I have, this, I have this really firm belief that when you go to a yoga class, you really can't learn yoga in a whole in 60 to 90 minutes, even if it's a two hour class. Yeah. So you're there to practice primarily one thing and sometimes two, depending on who's, who's guiding the class. But the thing you're there is to practice asana. You're, you're there to strengthen your body. You know, um, and the way that it's taught, there's so many different philosophies, the way it's taught, the way your concentration should go. Um, but you have this one opportunity while you're there. And it just becomes like this meditation for them. So when I speak to the kids, I try to tell them that you can get strong from this. You know, you can you can learn from this and it'll help you in all sports. I, I always reference a lot of athletes that take yoga, practice yoga. So, so... Uh, and so for you and for people that come to, to a class, like let's just say when, when practitioners come for the first time, um, if they're, fr so a lot of people I know will get frustrated, right? They'll show up <laughs> to yoga class and they'll say, well, I don't have the stamina. I don't have the flexibility. Yeah. I don't have the attention span, right? I don't, whatever it is, fill in the blank. Therefore, I've tried it and it's not for me, right? And this is just like a conversation I had a few episodes ago with, uh, a meditation teacher, a friend, Carrie Tamora, he's a meditation teacher. And I asked him the same question. Very often I'll talk to people and they'll say, oh, I tried meditation, but my mind wouldn't shut off. Yeah. Or um, I just couldn't focus or whatever. So I, it's not for me. I can't do it. And I'd imagine that just, you just called it a practice. So I'd imagine that yoga is in your mind is pretty similar to what meditation should be, which is a practice, Absolutely. which, which, which involves kind of doing work and it's, you're not going to get it one time. But what do you actually tell the student that shows up that says, hey, look, I don't think this is for me or I, I, I'm not good at this. What, like, what kind of words of encouragement would you give to somebody who wants what yoga offers but feels like it's just too difficult for them to, 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 to attain? I tell anybody that's new to me, show up, shit changes. Every single one. You know, um, everybody has these feelings about anything that they start. Like to go back to reflect on the last conversation we just had about me going to schools and talking to kids. You know, like when I say you choose something and do this, it means like it's difficult to practice to learn something, you know, especially as we get older, to, to try to do something new. So everybody that comes in, they all have that same thing. It's like it should be on like a list of things that people normally say. You know, they're going right. to be lost. They're going to feel silly. They're out of shape. They're not flexible. And, you know, but then the same typical thing that people would say, even being be a meme is, you know, you go to yoga to become flexible. So, you know, it's so, we're all such alike and we all say that similar things. And the only thing that is different is really the, the letting go of the ego. And I mean like the way you look, just the letting go of like willing to learn, willing to try something, willing to fail, willing to repeat and over and over and over and over and over again. And then the end result, you're a different human being. And that's what I mean by show up and shit changes. So anybody that comes to me, I just kind of laugh with them. And I say, I said, I'm, it's, it's not easy for me. It's so freaking hard to teach a yoga class. You know, I mean, some people, maybe it's easy for me. It's hard as hell, you know? And I think um, for the people that come there, I know it's hard for them as well too. But you keep showing up and when you're done, you're done and you feel, you feel amazing. And you move on. Yeah, I can't imagine how it is to teach you a class. I, I actually visualize doing that sometimes. I've, I've, the ones I've showed up to, and I'm like, I, I don't know if I could ever do this. But, <sighs> but I want to ask you a bit about that. So you said it's same, same for you. What about you? Your introduction to yoga, like, what was that like? And how did you did you realize it was a practice right away? And was it something you knew you wanted to make a discipline for yourself right away? My introduction to yoga was a long ass time ago where you couldn't buy yoga mats. Um, and I got ran over by a car oh, wow. in Selden. All right. It was, uh, it was, a, it was like a, as I say the words, I could see it. Wow. And, you know, I was like, I was with my mom and we played basketball a lot and we played basketball so much in the street that uh, we hung up lights in the trees. So uh, I got out of a car and we lived at the bottom of a hill 
and a car came flying over the hill. And it was, it was normal for cars to come fast over the hill. You know, that's what people do in the, in the burbs. They drive fast in the side streets. Um, so I put my hands out as a dude was coming over the hill, like, bro, slow down. And when he, when he saw me, I saw him and he turned the wheel and he ran over me. And intentionally, yeah, totally just ran right over me. Whoa. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Right over my whole body, my face, everything ran right over me. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. So, um, it really jammed me up hard, man. So I was in the hospital for a bunch. Um, I had to rehabilitate a lot. Um, my whole body was twisted sideways and I was doing the whole, you know, chiropractor and, uh, and pain pills and stuff like that. And I got mad love for chiropractors, you know, and at the time I had mad love for pills. So, and it's like, there's, there's, it wasn't working. And then uh, a friend of mine bought me this book. Um, his name is Jack. And he bought, he uh, bought his book. It was called, um, what was it? 26 Postures or something like that. But it was, uh, it was this woman in leotards. And there were these illustrations of this, of these poses. Um, the, it'll name will come to me. And, he said, he said, I've been doing this because we both rode bikes growing up. So when you ride a bike, you fall a lot, you get hurt a lot. So you got to always rehabilitate your body, snowboard as everybody does. Um, so I started doing the book. The book made a lot of sense. And I was just doing it on a towel on, on the ground. And I just kept on studying and studying. And um, I started feeling better. And after that, that a couple of years later, I stopped doing it. You know, cause I felt good mm -hmm. and it's like, and it's a discipline. So like you gotta do it. It's like going to the gym, you know what I mean? Like to having a trainer or not having a trainer. Right. You gotta have that discipline. You gotta have that commitment. So a lot of people that practice yoga, me included, when you feel good, you kind of like, oh, I'll walk away from it for a little while. And then on, then you need a sign for it to go back to it. So that's what I did. And when I, and then I got hurt again and then I went back to it again. Um, and then went right back into the practice and then, I left it again, started doing other things like other movements, you know, a lot of dancing. Um, and then once the, I don't know, about maybe 15 years ago, when I went back, I never stopped since then. So it's really, and that's when, that's when teaching really fell into place and all that stuff. So for you, it was, it was initially a primarily a physical thing. You were drawn to it because of what it offered you from a physical sense. It was, it was medicine. It would, it, it straightened my body, it straightened my back out. It also gave me, Someone that doesn't really practice a, um, like I believe in God wholeheartedly, I believe God is all over. Um, but I'm not uneducated when it comes to religion. So you, you want to have faith. And then as yoga is a science, that's when I really started getting into the science of it. I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. You know, for me, the way that I like to walk the earth, you know, and, and then you kind of like, because it's, it's not, faith this is a science you kind of like make science your own and that's how it really resonated with me and it helped me f to get through all of that all of that pain and and suffering i was doing for all those years it was it was bad i couldn't i couldn't um yeah i couldn't sit for a long time like, you know it was really bad my whole my whole body was bad wow it was bad and it so was, what you do really bad. besides yoga, were you doing, was yoga the primary practice that you used to kind of. When I re when I rehabilitated my body, it was only yoga. Wow. Strictly and only yoga. Um, the third time that I hurt my body, I was working in, I was working in the city and, uh, and I slipped and fell. I was wearing, I was, I was wearing uh, flip-flops and going too fast <laughs> and I slipped and fell and, and I, and I blew, I hurt my lower back. And where I, um, and I was commuting five hours a day and I couldn't sit down during the commute. Oof. So, and this was for seven months. Yeah. And so what I did was I, I practiced a few yoga poses that I can do and I held planks. And then I started doing this long plankathon thing. Like I can hold planks for a long time. So I was doing like 10 minute hold planks, wow. you know, with, with peas on my back. Cause I was, I was going into empty offices and taping like frozen vegetables to my back to reduce the swelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my homie, that was a chiropractor. I would go to the chiropractor early in the morning. And then when I got off the train, he would put this thing called the tens machine and tune my back up. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then um, I would make it to work. And then I would just go into some empty offices and I would do a lot of like child's pose, a lot of Cobra, a lot of um, Sphinx um, and then some bridge work and stuff. And uh, you know, and breathing, lots of breathing, and then lots of plank holding. 
and then I haven't had a you know knock on or whatever. I haven't had a lower back problem in such a long time now. Sense of it. Wow. Yeah, and my my classes are revolved around like what has happened to me in my life. Like you know, like I've I got crazy knee problems. I had four knee knee surgeries. You know, my lower back problems. Um, as a male, you know, just naturally tight. So I just started thinking, like, how can I? What can I give back? And then I started seeing who I was attracting. You know, and it was really made a lot of sense. Who are you attracting? I was attra- I I was attracting the par- the person that walked into the room, like you said. Like I'm not flexible. I don't know what yoga is. Yeah. You know, and the the class itself. If it if it sparks interest, like anything else in our lives, if it sparks interest, you open up the door and you walk in. So if you, if you take a yoga class and you feel good and you know and you leave and, and anything you do, you pick anything. If you don't feel good at the end, you know what I mean. You better yeah. you got to feel good. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. if you feel good, you open the door and you're like, what is yoga? And then you know here in the West we call yoga. We're referring to pretty much just one limb of the yoga. It's just the, just work the working out part, the strength in the body. And and some people say that oh, you're not supposed to say that it's it's a workout. You're supposed to say it's a work in. That's like another mean person. That's like people trying to make something to put on Instagram. You know, it's like <laughs> the idea of in in my understanding of it, how I see it, is that you you practice the yoga to strengthen your body. You you practice to sit, right? To sit in contentment to sit for a while and to be comfortable. And the only way people are comfortable that it can sit, right, is people that are strong, you know? So if you got to put that work in and that's where, that's where the asana comes from, that's where the, that's where the, that's where the repetition comes from. And that's what, why yoga practice is so important to, I believe, to all of the human race, you know? Uh, I, so I'll give a personal anecdote there. <laughs> I, um, I was going through a, a tough time in my life emotionally, like f- six years ago. So I decided I wanted to do something really extreme, and I wanted to go to uh, a silent retreat in, <laughs> in uh, for a lineage that I had been kind of following for a while. And there was a teacher, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, is, is the original teacher. Reggie Ray runs Dharma Ocean, which is a lineage, and Reggie Ray was Trungpa's one of Trungpa's main students. And I just resonated with his teachings for a long time, listened to his podcast, his guided meditations, and uh, did a few programs there. So I decided, um, I think I was, I was going through a tough breakup at the time. So I just wanted to change. I was working in Wall Street, crazy hours, and just my life was just not, I felt like out of control. So I thought, let me shake myself up and I'll go and I'll, I'll do this thing where it's a, it's a month long Datsun. So really it's a month long silent retreat, but I, only, oh. I caught it two weeks in and it's around Christmas and my birthday and New Year's. So it's going to be, they cut your phone off. No, you know, words and nothing. And it's just a shocking experience. So I was like, this is what I want. And so I went out there, I had a petition to get in by the third week. Cause at that point they're doing advanced meditation training. Yeah. Sits. So you have to have be an advanced practitioner or you just got to, I, I pled with them. So please let me in. And they said, fine, we'll let you in. So I get there and the silence was hard. Like that was tough. No, no stimulus and no books, nothing. You just had to be with yourself 24 seven, no words. Even if you had, I had roommates, couldn't talk to each other. Um, you, you ate and you cleaned up together and no words and any of that. And then you practiced, you meditated 45 minute sits from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, or like 9 p.m. a couple of times throughout the day. So for anybody who has never meditated or hasn't meditated in a long time, sitting in one location for 45 minutes in a, in a shikantaza pose, which is what this is called, um, which is basically a, you're seated Indian style and you're kind of straight up. It's, it's, it's a lot on your back. And if you don't have core muscles and you, your body's not strong, it can be, you would never think it, but it could be, you might know, but it's excruciating pain. Yeah. So I was sitting there in excruciating emotional pain and I'm in excruciating physical pain, right? So I'm just sitting there, these 45 minute sits that I wasn't meditating. I was literally just sitting in pain. It was just pure. The pain was your meditation. The pain was my meditation. <laughs> I sat there for 45. They, they finally got, it got so bad, like a few days in where not just me, a few other people who couldn't hack it. They were like, look, for those people who are in severe pain, like we'll get, we'll get you some chairs and you could sit and you still meditate. You still sit, but you're going to be in chairs in the back row. I was like, get me a chair. I'll take a chair right now. Yeah. Chair coming up. Yeah. And because I wanted to meditate, but I was in such crazy pain. And I was, I thought I was in like good shape. Yep. I've never been in terrible shape. I was in horrendous shape for, for sitting for 45 minutes. Had I been doing, had I had a st- serious yoga practice or 
which is where a lot of people in the room actually did have a good yoga practice and sitting at 45 minutes at a time was nothing for them. Uh, but for me, it was almost impossible and mm. it couldn't, and it prevented me from actually getting the benefit of the meditation that we were really trying to achieve and accomplish there, which meditation is meditation, but there's still some benefits you're trying to get out of it. Um, Cause it could be different for everybody, but the physical pain part, I knew right then that <coughs> but, excuse, I knew right then that I had to, I had to either get a yoga practice or I had to figure out some kind of core work. Otherwise I wasn't going to be able to meditate yeah. going forward. I, I have a question for you. Um, when, when you watch the people that in the room get up after 45 minutes, did they just get up or did they move through like some, some asana? Did they move through poses before they stood? Most people moved around. Before and most, they yeah, before they stood, yeah. most people were definitely moving through different poses. Yeah. yeah. You don't just spring up usually from, you shouldn't probably spring up yeah. from, that, from that situation. No. But, uh, but uh, uh, someone has awareness of their body and understands what they can move their body to feel better from that, from that, from that work, you yeah. know, from that practice right there. Yeah, it's cool. We, we also, so there was sitting meditation, we did walking meditation mm, and we that's did- my favorite. And we did uh, somatic meditation laying down. So, yeah. so laying meditation. Were you a practitioner before you went there? Did you, did you, could you sit for that long? Cause that's, that's intense right there. So it had been a while. Uh, uh, years <laughs> earlier, I want to say 10, eight, 10 years earlier, I had a pretty good practice where I would sit like 45 minutes a day. Uh, oh. So that was, and I could do it without much interruption. It had been years since I was able to do that. So because I couldn't do it, or at least I still thought I had it, you yeah. know, in me, I'm like, oh, I got this. I'll pick it back up. My back was just, it just couldn't yeah. handle it. It was so on fire. So what about mentally, how did you do mentally? It broke me. I had to, I had to be broken. Uh, first six days, I actually tell the story a lot. <laughs> 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 We're in the middle of um, the Rocky Mountains and there's nothing. There's like no Wi-Fi. There's nothing. There's no signals or anything. You're in the middle of no five hours south of Denver in a place called Crestone, which is actually a spiritual town. It was given by the state of Colorado, originally the Rockefellers to the state of Colorado to then give to 501c3 religious organizations. So you have a ton of Tibetan communities in there. You have a bunch of Christian communities in there. All these different meditative communities have built their lands and their ashrams and their temples in that area. It's a very charged area. It's a very amazing area. But there's nothing there. I mean, literally, like no one lives there. It's just like people come in for retreats. Very few people live there. So by the third day or so, uh, I realized it was my birthday and I can't get texts or anything. And like, and I was just like, not, my back was on fire and I couldn't deal with myself anymore. So I was like, how do I get out of here? Like, I got to get the hell out of here. So I went to, I grabbed my phone and I, I found some like little area that I could actually get some reception. And I was like Googling how to find a taxi in the area. And like 20 miles away, there was some town, I think called Moffat, where uh, they had a taxi number or like a number to a car. And I call it and it's some dude that's like a plumber who just like happens to drive a truck to like drive people around on the side. And he was like, hello. And I'm like, Hey man. And he couldn't understand me. And I'm trying to say, I'm like, are you the taxi? He's like, yeah, I drive sometimes. I'm like, can you come over to, to Crestone and pick me up? I was trying to get out of there. I was like, I, I paid a couple grand for the thing. And I was like, I don't care. Just get me out of this place. The phone dropped. I, the call dropped, the phone died. Like, and that was it. Like I couldn't get a hold of the guy. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm stuck. Like I have no choice. I'm stuck in this hell hole. Like I have no choice. This is day what? What day is Two it? Two or three. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now I'm like, what do I do? Like, I'm just trapped here. Uh, so I just kept showing up. I just kept going to the sits. I hated every minute of it. Yeah. It was pure torture until like the fifth or sixth day. We did this practice called a darkness practice, which Actually, you kind of call in some spirits. It's a really cool thing because we were on Native American, like very hollow Native American land out there in Colorado. And like you feel the energy of the land. And so we were like, there was like drumming involved. There was like darkness involved. And you're kind of calling uh, different deities. And it's an interesting practice in in this particular lineage, uh, Buddhism. And like that kind of woke me up a little bit. It was kind of like, whoa, something's happening here. And then um, I had a pretty cool experience on the trail. We have a dorm and then you have the shrine room, which is gorgeous. You walk into the shrine room and you just see like the horseshoe uh, mountains of, of the Rockies and oh. you're, you're up in the clouds and it's the shrine room is beautiful. I mean, oh. it's probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And you're practicing in the shrine room and it's just all glass. And um, I had like a moment uh, in the trail before getting to the shrine room where I was just staring in the mountains like, help me. Like, come on, someone do something. Like I'm, I'm at a loss here. Like I'm in bad shape emotionally, physically. 
And something just cracked, snapped for me. And then from that day forward, I was almost blissed out. Like something just changed. Hmm. And then the rest of that experience for the next eight days couldn't have been. It was it was a life-changing experience. Wow. I was actually in every my, the meditation, even though I had pain, I was in it. I knew what was going on. I was, I was conscious. I felt like beyond my ego. I felt really tapped in. Um, I was getting the teachings. It just felt really, really transformative. But it took, it, it felt like somebody broke my spirit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I got that. We were just talking about the, the parallels between Chinese medicine and yoga and how Chinese medicine uh, encourages people to kind of, you know, essentially yin and yang, undo the the thing that you had done. So if you work core and your core muscles are really tight from working out, if you do a back bend, that's sort of um, it's 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 known to allow your chi to kind of flow and kind of circulate. And Coco was just talking about movement. You want to just say what you were saying about people that were if you sit for a while. Well, I mean, naturally, when we sit for a while, that this is why I love to watch animals. I mean, I'm not a cat person yet. I will be maybe one day. <laughs> uh, but I do have dogs. And it's interesting when, when you see a dog or a cat, they sit for a while that before they get up and venture, they always make a stretch. Yeah. Have a stretch. And it's it's just because they're trying to break up the fascia in the body to get that fluid movement, right? Mm-hmm. That that find that flow in the body, the movement of the chi. And um it's that's what I really find beautiful about a, a yoga a yoga practice is that you're gonna resonate to the things that really hold you back. And you're going to try to work through them, you know, and, and work through them. So if you're sitting at a chair all day, you're going to want to stand up. And every time you look up and reach back, your body just has this beautiful feeling to it because mm. of it's something different throughout the day. Yeah, I've noticed in all of the, um, when I'm encouraging people, I'm always trying to encourage people to look up, to look up because we just, we just look down so much now. Mm. So, and I feel like, that's like similar to like moving the chi in the body. We're always looking down. We're never looking up anymore. We're right. missing. We're just missing so much of the world. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, I want to go back for a second to. Uh, you had said something to me recently when we, before we spoke before the podcast about your vision for starting some your studios was that you wanted to bring yoga to everybody, right? Yeah. You wanted to bring it. You wanted to kind of democratize yoga, basically. Pretty much, man. <laughs> So where where does that come from? And then um, what do you think of the challenges to that? Do you think that it's not something that's commonly done? Uh, it comes from, um, I think it comes from the way, way I was raised. It comes from me being from the town I was I was raised in. Um, before before this, I before I started teaching yoga, um, I used to have a clothing company and a BMX team and like just a community called Fat Relics. And they were on Long Island. And um it was, I started building that to, um, to notice the people and you, you, you get the sense of helping, you know, you get the sense of, of being there. And when the, you, you asked the question about the studio, correct? How the studio was ran? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of uh, democratizing it, like what exactly do you do to make sure that everybody gets access? So to go back to what you were saying before, when you were teaching, when you said most of the classes you took were in gyms. Yeah. Right. Right. When I first started teaching, I started teaching originally in yoga studios, and then I started teaching in yoga and gyms. And once I started teaching in gyms, I realized that there was a separation of the people that were coming into these things, but they all wanted the common goal. You know, they wanted the common thing. So these people didn't think that they should take go to a yoga studio. You know, in the yoga studio, people, some of them were like, I'm not going to go to a gym. Why so, is that? Can you just break it down a little bit? Like, oh, what, man. What do you think people in a, in a gym, what are, the, what, are the, what are some of the reasons why you think they might not want to go to a yoga well, studio? Well, I think it's some of the, some of the whatever, whatever sex you are, you know, mommies or puppies, you know, like if, if, they're, if they're genetically, where everything's working out for them, you know, one of them is going to, one of them is going to make them sexier and they're going to just keep riding that doggy, you know? And then the other one is probably money. You know, money has held back a lot um, why people don't practice yoga. Mm. Um, like, so why people don't golf, it's expensive as hell. Mm-hmm. Um, money. And it's also the, the question you asked before is about why is it not, you know, everywhere? Like, I'm trying to make it everywhere. Mm-hmm. 
when I, I'm teaching a wrestling team right now in Newfield High School. The, I, went oh, to, yeah. I went to Newfield. Yeah. So I'm teaching this, the, varsity, cool. the varsity team and I'm teaching them or having class the day before their meet. And we're on week two. So, and then we, in, in the second week, they've already got the first part down. We got the breathing down. We've been doing the meditation. Um, and I said to them, I'm like, if you got, if, if the school would understand how important a yoga practice is, all of you guys would have known what we're doing. If I asked you guys to, you know, um, play, uh, what do you call that? Dodgeball. <laughs> right? Right. Then they would they would know it. Right? Basketball, then they would know it. I said, this is the things that they teach you in gym. Right. You know, so if they looked at it this way, you know, I said, but your coach knows, and that's why he hired me to come in. You know, so mm-hmm. it's 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 so old and it's really, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be alive the day that it becomes, you know, super mainstream. You know, yeah, and that for everybody. But I've been I've been trying to make it for everyone forever. And what I mean by everyone is I always explain the yoga class. I, <laughs> every time I'm at a bar, people always ask me, "I got to do yoga. I got to do yoga." You know, what I mean, if, it, it's just a common thing. Someone always comes to you and tells you their shit. My back hurts. My this hurts. That hurts. Ah, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then I'm like, and then like, oh, I don't want to go into a room. I'm gonna look like an asshole. You know, I'm not I'm not flexible. And I go turn around. I go, so see if we at this bar or restaurant. I was like, see if. I'm, so I said, the guy with the hair and this person, I was like, like, this is what a yoga class looks like. And I said, the, the funny thing is, I said, your ass gets there. I'm like, you can't, you're suffering. Because most people take yoga classes, they suffer. They straight up suffer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's what in lies. If you go back to your story. Yeah. You were suffering. Yes. Until one day. Right. right. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. That happens to every single buddy mm. that rides that wave. Yeah. That rides that dog. They get in there. They put the work in and then all of a sudden, boom. And that's, it, that belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to the person that can spend $125 a month on top of three other memberships. You know, it belongs, it belongs to everyone, you know, and like the way that people, the way that people teach it, you know, because you have to believe you have to, it's a trusting, it's a huge, 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 huge trusting in, in a yoga class. Yeah, You got to trust. If you don't trust, you know, cause you're going in there and you're like, all right, please, Please, please do something nice. You, you gotta, you, you like a band. You go see that band because that band built trust by you listening to that music over and over and over again. Yep. So when you take a yoga class, you better go in there and you gotta have some trust. And it, it's like I do back to the thing. It's hard to teach a yoga class. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm totally guilty of like going to a class and finding an instructor I didn't like or no, you're not or uh, no, but and then, and then going like never like not not seeing them again personality like, dog yeah I'm, I'm a huge to me with yoga classes in particular and meditation sits if if there's something there that doesn't re- you know whatever doesn't drive with me on some level i'm like that's it for me like i saw you once and I, that'll be that and I'm, i keep it moving because um it, like you said i don't basically i don't trust the person and not just from a where you're going to guide me in terms of my physicality but also like if you're going to start talking about sort of spiritual elements and you seem to me like there's maybe some materialism there or some disingenuous there. And I'm again, I'm only getting this in a 30 minute, 60 minute read, right? Which is crazy, but still I trust my intuition. Yeah. Um, then I'm not, if I don't trust you, I'm, I'm, you're likely not going to see me yeah. again. Yeah. I, I call it, I call it the first date. It really is. Yeah. yeah. I've been t- every, every time people call um, and ask me about coming to the studio or coming to one of my classes, and I, and I, and I always say it's, it's like a first date, Yeah, you know, and I'm like, you know, and I, I, and the dividend to me for always teaching and, and trying and helping is that there's nothing like it when, when someone has that cracked moment, like you had on mm-hmm. that mountain. So this has been a pretty cool conversation. So I, I, I want to understand exactly what motivates you. Like why, why are you, why are you doing what you do now? Um, What's motivating me? I think it's. It's always been the same. Um, the people, I, I, I really enjoy helping people. And, and this is the one way that I've learned in my life, my path that I can help, you know, and it's, and it's a give and take relationship because they help me. They give me purpose. Um, it gives me, it challenges me mentally. You know, there's, when I, people, I drive around, I think about um, what I'm going to, 
do in class, what I've done in class, the people that are in my classes, what how I can help, what we can do, um, just to try to get better at your craft, at what your passion is to share. So what motivates me is is people, is, is just trying to help society. I think I think if more people practiced all movement practices, you know, that uh, it'd be a nicer world, you know. Um, that's what I've learned. But what motivates me is really just for the love, for the love of moving people. So you just said all moving practices. So I, I want to ask one thing, because you talked about before people come there, or you, you have people, you view yoga as medicine for your body. Mm-hmm. And many people have too. I know a lot of what we talk about here in the soul pod are people that deal with, we deal with a lot of trauma workers, for yeah. example. Yep. One of the famous works by uh, by Bessel van der Kolk, uh, who is the former director of uh, Harvard Medical School, who had worked in psychiatry. He worked on PTSD. Um, he wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Body Keeps the Score. And it's, uh, it's an amazing book. And it kind of set off a chain reaction within different healing modalities of people that said, in, in his book, he stresses yoga is an important practice for trauma release. Um, I yeah, and, and there are works by a guy named Peter Levine who does somatic experiencing, similar train of thought that that trauma actually gets trapped in the body and that we, our limbic systems, with our fight or flight reactions, it actually, we store trauma. And so you can work through it with talk therapy all you want or conceptually all you want, but it's your body that's going to actually release trauma. Do you have any experience or do you know anybody that ever comes to yoga that is trying to work with trauma or emotional elements of their life? I mean, we, and we've had, you know, countless amount of people that have come in for those reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, from, from trauma, from being something happened young, um, to being in one of the wars. Um, we've had people that have come that have, um, learning disabilities. And I've seen by the discipline of showing up. And I think it's best used for trauma because when in a yoga class or in your home yoga practice, it takes a lot of patience and time. You know, when I mean by time, like you ask somebody to do something for two minutes straight. A lot of times that's very challenging for the for the common folk. It's you know, yeah. it's very challenging. So when so when you're there, you're figuring out how to stay there in this position that we normally wouldn't do during the day. I always, I say this a lot. I'm like I'm like, we pretty much only have a few movements we do with our bodies during the day. It, like, it's just, like the way that we, the people before us have invented things and how we go about things, everything is in the same, It's we have the same movements. We reach forward, we reach the side a little bit, we hardly reach straight up. You know, there's like, the right. body is, the body is becoming limitless, is, is becoming, it's limiting because of what is, how we are, how we get into our car. Cars used to get down low. Now you just go right sideways. It's 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 really so. When you move outside of that box, your body really starts to change. You start to develop, and then you start to call everything that you do a yoga practice. It really like the, everything out there is so to have that movement practice in your, and that's why I call it movement. And when they, when I was call, talking about other things like tai chi, qi, uh, qi gong, um, grappling, um, taekwondo, kung fu. All of these are taking your body out of the movements that you're typically doing throughout the day. And once you start adding these other movements, your body's recognizing, and then these the chi opens up, as you would say. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it makes sense that you need to interrupt the the typical habitual patterns of just not just your mind, but of your body as well. To, yeah. to release and get out of these uh, stuck cycles that we we can we end up in if we don't. They can get to it too. Like a lot of people that have a lot of people that I recognize that go are going through trauma. They need they they need to come to class so they can be distracted, hmm. right? So that's what they come like like there's there's and there's different ones. Some people that are some people that some people like to move. Some people want to move like they just want to sweat, move, and that's so they can't think of whatever's going on. And some people don't want to move. They want to sit and think, you know, and then hopefully empty the tank by showing up so many times, mm-hmm. you know, and then it'll be the next thing they'll, they'll have to get over. So, but they're, but they all come for different reasons. And what's beautiful about doing, being there for them is that they had somewhere to come to. Right. You know, like if you're, if you're going through trauma or 
you're pissed off or whatever. The, the places that you go, like if you didn't have something that you built up over the years, like if it's running, you go run your ass off. If you work out, you're going to just go lift your ass off, right? If, you go, if you're a yoga practitioner, you're going to go to a, a the yoga class and that's where you're going to, people come there to mourn, right? People come to yoga for a lot of different mm-hmm. reasons, but it's theirs. They get to come to it. Right. It's their ritual. It's their, it's their practice, you know? And, and on my, my hope is I just keep the way that I speak and talk about it. I hope that it resonates with people and that they try that they try it. And if it's not this, let it be something else. Let it be like, just don't take a Kung Fu class. You know, like right. if you're going to take, if you can, not like spinning, you know, for my spinning people, don't be, don't get pissed off at me, but like none of this weird, like <laughs> straight up, just one fucking movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like step outside, you know what I mean? Get off the thing, you know, do a backflip, fucking roll over. Right. You know what I mean? Do something. Right, right, right. Instead of just one typical straight thing. So yeah, right. the spinning people get pissed off because I like, I like to make fun of other shit because right. back to the story about me telling the kids, you got to pick something. You got to pick something that's going to take care of your shit. What's going to take care of you? What's going to help you sit up tall? What's going to allow you to, you know, to, to, pass wind with breeze, you know what I mean? To not be pissed off at the world. You know, what's, what is, what is going to be the one thing that you choose in your life? It, and it might be just TV watching, right? It really, yeah. and it's nothing wrong with that. We right. all, we all have to choose that one thing, you right. know? And I, and TV watching is passive. So it allows people not to be pissed off. True. Yeah. 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 No judgments, right? I yeah. mean, whatever, whatever it is that works for somebody in terms of making them feel comfortable, yeah. secure and safe. And when it, you know, everybody's working from different frequencies and different capacities. So whatever, whatever practice it is that allows one to feel safe yeah. or feel themselves really. Yeah. No judgments about it. I think people can definitely see when they're going through trauma and taking yoga classes, they definitely feel safe in the room because everybody's focused on themselves. Mm-hmm. A lot of eyes are closed. You know, it's like, it's everybody is going through their own struggle. You know, it's just your individual mat, your body, your breath. And um, yeah, so many people. I think if it's not dra- if it's not trauma, there's, it's another reason. There's always something that brings people. It's it's always something up here mm-hmm. or something in the body. Right. That's what brings them closer. Look, pain brought it to me. Right, right. You know? Yeah. And, and, and you ask me like, what keeps me going? It's like, what is it? Why does a doctor become a doctor or a teacher become a teacher? Right? They want to. They want to have that change. They want to make that change. Be the change. So that's been. That's really been my goal. I, I. I love the way that I've seen people take this practice and have it their own and leave and move other states and countries and they still keep doing it and and um, you know, it's like that mark you're leaving on the world, the legacy. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you? What What's next for Coco? What's next for Coco Motion? What, what comes next? What next? Um, man, I have no idea. I, I've always, I've always, before, um, I opened, I opened my first studio, opened it up about seven years ago and I was working full time in the city. And so, and my, my studio that I built is in Miller Place and it's in a warehouse and it's uh, right next to a garbage compactor. Um, and there's no windows. It's just a door. People call it the speakeasy. <laughs> uh, it's got it's got leaks when it rains. You know, yeah. the floor got fucked up from one of the leaks, uh, but it's people still practice on it. But the floor is su- it's super clean, super creative. You know, I did this crazy painting, um, but I always thought, you know, that I'll just be teaching yoga. You know, that's what I always wanted to do. Um, but I've always had a full time job, so this is the first time in my teaching life that I'm mean, not having a full time job and still owning a yoga studio. And, you know, with the pandemic and hardly people come like they used to, it's very difficult. So what I want to do is that I want to make it through this. I'm committed to to keep fighting the fight. I'm trying to get smarter as a business person, you know. Um, yeah, I really hope to die helping in some capacity, you know, if it's breathing, if it's moving, you know. I don't know. I don't, this is... I'm going to do this. I'm going to make some art. I'm going to try to live light, um, you know, have positive impacts on my family and friends. Yeah, man. I just, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm, the goal is to, is to really leave a beautiful light for everyone around. I'm pretty sure you've already started. <laughs> pretty sure from, uh, just from based on what I know about you, based on what you've done already. You, you, I think you're well on your way. <laughs> you're well on your way to doing that. You know? Yeah, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah. So Coco, man, so, so happy to have you here. Nice to finally meet you. Yeah. 
Uh, I had a great time chatting. Um, yeah, totally. I want to make sure before we close out that you get to plug your studio, get to plug anything you're working on. Um, just make sure to mention, you know, what you think is important. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, again, the yoga studio is called Coca Motion, and my friend James named named it when I when I decided to open the studio. It was it was a really hard task because I knew it was over my head. So I I text everybody on my phone. And a bunch of people came back with funny names. One of them was Coco's Yoga Palace by my friend Dave. That was really funny. And then um, I asked a group of people and they, my friend James at Coco Motion, and that's how the name became. Of course, our class is involved in moving and we like to string movement together. And we also like to go outside of a typical yoga class because you've taken yoga classes and you've taken a Pilates class. Maybe you've taken a CrossFit class or maybe you've taken a movement class, a breakdancing class, a Tai Chi class. And we try to blend as many of the movement dialities that make sense to us and use the yoga poses as the root, as like the meeting spot. But what can you learn from, from the back of the mat to the front of the mat and through this process while breathing and trying to stay focused on the first task, which is hence meditation. Focus on one point for a certain period of time. So then through this, it becomes a movement practice. It becomes a well-rounded, um, logical, functional class. And that's what the studio is there for. And that's what I'm hoping to bring into the future because we have to make this decision. And it's uh, the one studio we have today is in Miller Place in Marshall's parking lot next to the green dumpster. You can't miss it. But you're going to miss it because there's a green dumpster or a garbage compactor, which makes noise. Um, oh, you can catch me on Zoom. I teach on Zoom every day, every day of the week, um, 6 a.m., uh, 7 p.m. and on the weekends at 8.30. How do they find you on Zoom? Um, you just got to follow the studio and just hit me up. Send me a message. And what's what's your information on Instagram? Our Instagram account is Coco Motion. My Instagram is Yoga by Coco. Um, not a big Instagram person. I have I have shit loads of cool photos and stuff like that. That would mean a lot to me. How about your website? What's your Our website, website is CocoMotion.space. Um, CocoMotion.space. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Because when you, you know when, when you buy a, a domain, yeah. you run out of the names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it could have been like dot donuts. You yeah, know yeah, I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, totally. So <laughs> yeah. we're gonna drop all this in the show notes, all these links. So yeah, that'll be fine. But I just want to make sure everybody knows where to find your amazing classes that are unique. Yeah, if, if they don't find my class, if they don't find my class, just just move around. You know what I mean? Find something that makes you happy. You know, be silly and just move your body. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Coco. We appreciate it. And, yeah, brother. Uh, maybe Thank we'll have you back here sometime. Yeah, man. I would love that. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Take care. Yeah.